and then we'll just wait um, for attendees to pop in. Like I said, it usually takes like 30 seconds or so to a minute. Okay, people popping in. So uh, everyone who's here, we're just waiting a few more seconds for people to pop in. Uh, so we won't get started without anyone who's, whose software is still doing its job. Okay, I think I think that's good enough. Okay, so hello everybody, and uh, welcome to the third uh, installment of the Fall 2023 Sir Little Turnbull Design Lecture Series, which is here at Lehman College. Uh, today we're going to explore uh, our continued exploration of the gaze, and in this particular sec the session today, we're going to delve deeper into the female gaze and how it can subvert the traditional male gaze. But really, we're going to talk about the designer's gaze and what the gaze means in the context of design, which is great because this is a design lecture series. So we're really, really nailing it down today. Um, also, before we begin, I just want to remind you that the Lehman College Art Gallery uh, has installed a pretty tremendous exhibition entitled Framing the Female Gaze, uh, which explores the diverse ways in which the female gaze has begun to reshape our visual culture. Um, this exhibition showcases a pretty huge array of artists and, and it runs until January 20th of 2024. So you have pretty much all semester to see it. I really recommend you go check it out. It's um, it's 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 a really uh, good visual exploration of everything that we're talking about in this lecture series. Uh, and today, as I said, I'm particularly excited because we're gonna formally, first, first we're gonna formally design the concept of the gaze in the context of design. And we're going to explore how design interfaces with existing cultures, sometimes in really beautiful and harmonious ways, other times in really challenging ways. And moreover, we're going to delve into this crucial topic within design uh, privilege and its far reaching implications in our society. Um, so, without further ado, it's uh, uh, my pleasure to introduce our esteemed guest for today, Srishti Merotra. Uh, Srishti is a UX researcher currently making her mark at ID, IDFC First Bank in India. Uh, her professional journey has traversed pretty diverse uh, domains from uh, fintech and telecommunications to music and sustainable fashion. Her educational background, which encompasses knitwear design and strategic design management, really attests to her, her broad range of skills and insights. Um, and one of uh, Shushi's distinguishing features is her commitment to questioning the ethic of using sensitive customer data create, to create uh, value for businesses. She ponders the profound impact of design on people's lives, as all designers should, but she also emphasizes the significant role of designers within the, the broader ecosystem. Uh, she keenly recognizes the influence of power and politics in shaping design decisions, which is one of the main reasons I asked her to, to talk with us today. Um, and by, by beyond her professional endeavors, Trishti enjoy, finds joy in reading, creating art and writing. Her multifaceted approach to design and her exploration of its broader implications make her the best ideal guest for discussions of the role of design, privilege and ethics. So let's welcome uh, Trishti to share her valuable insights and perspectives on designs influence on our lives. Uh, welcome, Trishti. Thank you so much for uh, for being with us today. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much, David, yeah. uh, for your very kind and uh, <laughs> very kind introduction. It wasn't too long, so... I hope. <laughs> <laughs> so um, first of all, thank you so much for inviting me here today. And I think this is a topic that I've spoken a lot about with within my group of friends, within uh, some of the designers that I've worked with. And uh, it's something that 
uh, I've started questioning about a lot in the last couple of years. And um, yeah, I think it starts with, you know, I'll, I would like to start with a story about a project that we did. Um, it was part of an uh, part of an alliance between my college when I was studying for my master's and the government of Gujarat. And we were working to understand how how do we introduce or how do we increase the uptake of piped natural gas uh, in uh, in areas in Gujarat. And we were specifically studying uh, one part of Gujarat called Navsari. And we, we were visiting a few of the villages there so um, in the context of you know introducing um, you know development or um, you know in um, disseminating a development in initiative in areas that don't previously have them um, you know we we met a, a group of women in some of the villages and just a few years prior they had got access to piped water right so when we're talking about development, access to pipe, pipe water is essential and uh, it is necessary. And when, so we, we were talking to the people around that. And one of the things that emerged was that, you know, earlier before pipe water was readily available, a lot of the, uh, all the households had to collect water from the, the well in their village. And this was usually the job of the younger women in the family. So the daughters and daughters-in-law. And uh, they would have to go carrying buckets or carrying uh, pots and bring them back. And that was the quota of water for the household for the day. And uh, as soon as they got piped water, one of the things that, um, that we, like one of the things that we found out was that these women they were um, using this time that they got to spend outside of the house to congregate and catch up with each other spend time together uh, this was time that was spent uh, speaking with each other gossiping or uh, you know in general having uh, enjoyment which was outside the control or outside the vigilance of their families and um, because they had piped water, they they couldn't get to do that anymore. And uh, by no way am I saying that pipe water was um, you know was a disadvantage to them because it is a necessity. But at the same time, I think uh, every uh, every problem that exists or every uh, pattern or everything that we see when we are designing for people actually has more than one dimension so there is a there is a very uh, structural or a very tangible aspect of any problem and then there are these um, intangible and cultural um, things that develop around the problem or the way the problem is dealt with or there is a subculture that sort of emerges in uh, such situations and when we are designing for something uh, or we're designing to solve something in particular, we don't want to, uh, or we shouldn't ignore the other aspects of what that particular thing entails. So that was a that was a starting point when I when I started to question what are the far-reaching implications or things that we don't really design for. So obviously we design for the convenience and for uh, accessibility, but there are certain things that we don't design for and some things that we entirely miss. So um, that's that's really uh, what I want to speak about here, that when we design, how do we, how do we design? How do we look at the consequences of our design and how do we design so that there are uh, no, of unintentional consequences so and with that i think i started developing this idea of design having or designers having a particular way of looking at things which i'll get to late in uh, in a little while so but first i wanted to address the the theme of all of these conversations and of course we've spoken about this before and uh, i think people have heard about this so i'll quickly go through this 
um, the picture here is a collage of photos of a visual essay by John Berger uh, in the book Ways of Seeing, and that's one of the ways in which uh, one of the formats in which the term the male gaze was popularized, and essentially. if i had to just really be brief about it the male gaze is about power so um in terms of how things are represented from a masculine perspective for a masculine audience and um how in and as a constituent of male gaze is the depiction of men as um and men as people who have power over their surroundings and the depiction of women with um you know with respect to what can be done to them so there's men and what can they do versus women and what can be done to them so uh, that is the um you know i think the entirety of the gaze is you know how how we look at something is actually a power dynamic and obviously to somewhat to subvert the male gaze we have the female gaze which is uh, about you know looking at art fiction and other um, aspects of like man made creations and portraying women not as the opposite power dynamic but in terms of just portraying women as people who have agency and you know the the even with the female gaze right the bar is pretty low so uh like for example we have bechdel the bechdel test and it's the it's considered to be a a, a very simple test of whether a work of fiction or whether a movie is a feminist um movie or work of fiction and the only three criteria is that there should be two named women in that work of art or movie or fiction they should be speaking to each other and the topic of conversation should not be a man so it, the bar is literally that low but so many movies even at this point of time don't really cross that bar even the popular ones even the ones that don't seem um, extremely male dominated actually don't pass that test even movies which have um, you know women as leading characters so uh, i think that is the essence of gaze and gazes and i think as designers we also have a gaze where we look at certain things from a position of power and uh, definitely whenever there's power there's also an imbalance of power and um, that's what i wanted to talk about So, uh, what is designers' gaze? Designers' gaze is the way designers, or the particular way in which designers are uh, taught to look at the world. You know, we look at things and we want to solve problems. So, uh, I think in one way that's also glorified, but on the other hand, we have aspects of uh, design which, uh, or design's way of looking at the world, which can be a little. um what do you say ineffective or can have an un um an unwanted or unintended um consequences and i think uh, designers gaze has four major parts according to um my observation the first is who do we design for and you know typically uh in in one way it's not the fault of the designers because at the end of the day we want to earn our livelihood and we are um forced to design for people who can pay us but because we do that uh we end up designing for the people for the few people who have a lot of money to spend and even in terms of um, you know when when we're taught design theory we are taught to design for the people who are our customers so instead of talking to a random person we're taught to speak to the people who are actually already using our products so that's that the second is what we design so what are we whenever we design a problem i think oh sorry design to solve a problem 
we typically end up creating something new and um, i'll get more to that later but it's it's a it's about how much do we keep adding and what is the consequence of keeping or what is the consequence of adding more and more products more and more options varieties to um, the systems that we exist in and um, also what we design like what are the problems that we choose to solve a lot of times they are driven by external deadlines or um, you know external um, you know business value and timelines and you know the uh, requirements which kind of separate us from the long term uh, consequences which is which is my also th- which is also my third point which is about designers not having skin in the game meaning that most of the time and especially if uh, you know you're designing for something uh, you know like either you're designing a policy or you know you're designing for something more mass market or something for customers who are not exactly like yourself you are not affected by what you design so you know for for an agency perhaps or for a designer something might just be a failed project but for another person that might be a part of their life that gets affected the, a time that they don't get back so that is the third part and going back to what we design and how we are guided by businesses with i think there's also a, uh, a fourth part of what do we consider as value so what are and when we look at value right there are two meanings of the word so one is uh, you know what what something is worth in terms of money and the other is what what is something that you know people believe in or what people hold to be true when close and um, as designers i think we value different we end up valuing different things than probably what people value because we end up serving businesses or serving organizations so everybody has different things that they value so so this is um another one thing that happened to me just i think a couple of years ago i was working with a telco organization so i was working with uh, an organization which has a which has millions of customers across a spectrum of demographic demographics uh, abilities genders and uh, you know one of our projects was to try and find out who, why is it that Uh, or you know how do we optimize our application so that more people pay using that application i think it's a very uh, common business problem that you know every business would want to solve for and um, so at that time i was working on speaking with customers who were using our applications and trying to understand uh, how can i make it better how can we design better things for them and um, so we we used this approach where we we pulled out databases of our customers and we contacted them and we tried to speak with them and you know take some time for interviews and interview them and uh, use those findings to you know plug into the app again and uh, surprisingly for a long time all of our customers that we interviewed were male so and we continue to do that because um, you know, and even when we spoke to vendors and we said you know we would want like both males and females um, the the agency or the vendors who um, who were actually recruiting the customers on behalf of us would say you know women are very um, hard to recruit so how about you know we just uh, you know go ahead and do this project with men and uh, for a, for a while we said okay you know I, we don't see the problem so because anyway a majority of our customers a majority of our paying customers are men so that makes sense but you know one of those um, in it was also around the same time that i read this book it's called uh, invisible women and how um, you know the data of women is not really collected and women are not included in research 
um, and we take the the masculine or you know we create this universal masculine and we take it to the to mean the universal human so we just um, you know make everything for with that default um, human which is a male perspective so uh, that's that that's when i realized that you know i i really can't be doing that and i started pushing for uh, you know female candidates to be recruited into uh, into our uh, research studies and i actually like realized a few things that you know one of the things that made men use our app more was that you know when when we went deep into it we realized that men typically own private devices and uh, they also looked at you know doing things like payments or like paying bills etc to as their responsibility and they wanted to get done with it very quickly and therefore they valued ease they valued not having to put in too much effort they valued you know how fast things were done doing how convenient they were and um and uh, in that and if you look at it like this is really what we designed for in most applications or in most design solutions right we want to make things faster and more convenient and more effortless but when we spoke to the women they they said that they typically share their devices with children so if they're living at home and uh, they you know there are children nearby then uh, the children would typically use the mother's phone to play games or something and the mothers or the women were very um you know scared that accidentally the kids might uh, do something and if there is financial information saved on it or if they uh, you know if they accidentally uh, do a transaction or somehow lose money uh, you know that um, you know that made them very scared of even downloading these applications so uh, that's uh so that that was like this big difference that we found and i realized that by actually making the apps more and more uh, you know easy and convenient and uh, you know because we were speaking to men and we were catering to their needs and we were consistently making it better and better like we were optimizing for the male experience but not really paying attention to female or like women's requirements we were actually working in like the cycle of um marginal marginalization where you know we were pushing women further and further away because we did not cater to their needs or we didn't um talk about their anxieties or their issues and uh, i think that's that's something that now i have tried to deal with in some way by you know being more conscious and not just about the people who and you know right now for um ease of you know explanation and because we have a limited amount of time i'm talking about men and women but you know it's it's really more than that it's not just about men and women it's it's about levels and um, you know there there are so many genders in between there are so many different ways that people are marginalized in on basis of their class their caste um their level of ability or disability and i think when i say this example i'm just using it as is an as an example that is to be extrapolated that when we're designing for a default person or a default male you know cis head uh, able person we are systematically marginalizing Uh, a lot of other people that we are not designing for so and i think it's it starts with that so uh, that brings me to this part of you know the intersectionality of the design gaze and something else so like we already spoke about you know design plus male defaults um you know we we continue build, optimizing for uh, you know male default and we lose people who are you know who who are who don't have the same needs and um, yeah and i think uh, this also brings us or brings me to question a lot of the design principles or you know the heuristic principles that we take for granted that 
you know these are these are, these are thumb rules that we just keep just assume that all design requires but is that so does um you know for example there is um in the nielsen norman heuristics there is one heuristic which says clean and minimal design and uh, you know in in the context in the western context that may have a different meaning but when we're looking at designing for uh, a country like india where a lot of people are still a little scared of exploration or you know so people like like to have everything up front and not neatly hidden behind menus so it's just it, that, that's just one little way in which um you know our design principles or our design heuristics are not really universal so you know questioning that whole idea of what we've been taught in terms of what con constitutes good design so that's one the second is design with class and caste privilege and i have to talk about that because i think uh you know in in india in where i come from i am probably one of the most privileged people in terms of class and caste and uh, design itself i think is a subject where you know you it's it's not a very socially accepted subject yet or as a field of study it's not uh, it's not very um it's not considered to be a safe subject and um, you know there is a um, you know if if you are from a fam if you are from a background where you know you need to support your family then probably design is not something that you would go for so if you are getting into design it's usually that you have some amount of safety net you know you may have at least family who can take care of themselves or you may have um you know the the opportunity to fail or to try out new things which someone from without a certain level of privilege would not be able to study plus there's you know design education itself is rare there are very few colleges there are exams that you need to be that you need to clear it's an expensive course so um you know there is like there are things that i cannot speak about even in terms of design because that would you know because i come from a place of privilege as well so like we said earlier right i in so many cases i don't have skin in the game and therefore uh, i don't have the um, you know i don't suffer the consequences if i don't design well in some cases so i think there there is uh, you know again a power imbalance and then um, you know in the third part of this is design and additive consumerism which is like an umbrella term that i'm talking about uh, where you know it's uh, it has a point of tension where you know how do we decide decide what is the right thing to do and usually that comes from business and in, in like i said earlier um, you know designers don't always get to choose they don't really have an option but to yield to the business forces in order to survive but um, you know even as even our design solutions typically are additive they are um, you know increasingly fast paced so you know even as say for example a digital application you are releasing uh, updates every every few weeks in a lot of cases and when we design these products we are not um, we kind of you you know disenfranchise people who don't have um you know the ability to keep up so th that might be someone who just won't who doesn't um, you know who wants to conserve their limited phone data or maybe has limited space in their phone or maybe someone who's just held on to the same device for say 7 or 8 years and now their operating system or their device doesn't support an operating system and therefore our app cannot be used on their phone simply because they can't afford to upgrade or they don't want to upgrade so you know so i think that's you know when when we contribute to that we kind of also contribute to this disenfranchising of people 
who are like you know otherwise maybe poor or they are people who are um, you know uh, they're like someone who's already not in a place of power and we're like further pushing them down so i think um, that is so i don't have a lot of answers and and these were my questions and i just wanted to sort of leave with this or end with this that the unintended consequences of our actions also have the same effect as the intended consequences so you know we might end up we might choose to design to solve a particular problem but we don't have a lot of control over all the other consequences that a design solution leads to and um, you know probably yeah just thinking a little bit about what possibly could happen as well is a good place to start that uh pretty, that's it's very profound i mean you've said it in pure, in in very pure in basic terms but it's like a very profound statement um that i think it it kind of reminds me of like last week i was meeting with a artist activist andrea arroyo she's um she's an activist right and so she had something interesting to say about activism which um is that we you know when we especially men uh look when they look at activism they see it as problem solving as like a problem that needs to be solved with some direct action right and that itself is kind of problematic because um well her her final one of her final statements was that listening is activism um and i think it kind of stands th these two statements stand at the same level as each other in terms of importance um so i thought i was going to ask you you know, off, I mean, this is how I've always kind of looked at design. I mean, design has sort of a nebulous de definition as it is. It's, it's not art, but it's like in the same place as art, you know, and they're in the same sentence. Um, and, and I've heard it described as uh, designers solve problems, artists create problems. Um, so I guess what I would ask you is, is it, is potentially the problem here is that we're looking at design as problem solving as opposed to something else like that that involves listening um listening and and planning and and maybe not so much solving a problem but i don't know how i don't know what the language is for this like uh, here's a here's the only analog that i have that i know of um and this is so like it's not even my own cultures this is why this is also problematic but in in martial arts right there's like uh a few different flavors of martial arts there's like jujitsu there's judo there's karate you know all these things right so karate is like all about attacking and defending right it's it's when we think of martial arts we're thinking that right kung fu is another example right but there's in judo um and i know i'm not a judo expert i don't know very, i've never done judo i know nothing about it other than the fact that in judo, the distinction is that rather than attacking your enemy or defending blows from your enemy, it's all about using your enemy's attack to, you know, you transfer the energy. So it's really just about, it's about not just deflecting, but using the energy they're expending to get them out of the way so that you don't get attacked. It's like a very, very different um, philosophy in terms of, of um, martial arts and i realize the irony of using martial arts to describe this it's, but my, my point is is there a way that we can really look at design other than problem solving other than the sort of very actively in other words it's male default driven right it's like it seems like the idea of it being problem solving in its in its essential form is itself like a male driven philosophy can you comment on that i mean i i don't even know what i'm asking necessarily i'm just i feel like you're a good person to at least discuss this with i mean it it is a good question and uh, i really like what you said about judo and using the force of your attacker right. to um you know deflect that or like to 
uh, I don't know, to incapacitate them or, you know, just sort of save yourself and, you know, also prevent further attack or something. And I'm, and I was just thinking about this in terms of, um, you know, power dynamics or power politics as well. Like, uh, uh, like in a situation where you're the recipient of something that you don't get to decide, right? I think that's, that's a position where you don't really have a lot of power. But being a designer and especially like, okay, we're talking about male, you know, male designers or maybe we're speaking about like uh, male and Western designers who, you know, who, so there, there's like this hierarchy, right? And, um, you know, if you come from, so maybe if you're in a global agency and you're, you know, a, a really great designer there. So on one hand, if we could say that, okay, you know, you're not, um, you know, probably you may not be the best person to design for someone who is, who is never going to live your life. But at the same time, I think uh, there is the fact that someone has power. And if, you know, if, if you have that power, then I think it's, it's best to use it in a way that is constructive, in a way that is ethical and is the right, okay, I, I won't define that there is the right thing to do, but, you know, just use that power for, uh, and or maybe direct that power through someone who doesn't have it. So, you know, someone who, in a bigger agency, someone who is more famous, someone who is, uh, you know, more well known, might be able to have a certain uh, power to say no as well, or uh, you know, implement a different type of process. So instead of you know just having to execute something or just having to solve a problem in a particular way. You might address that problem, solve some part of it, but also look at design as not just that problem solving, but maybe also like future making or, um, you know, getting to a more ideal future state. So, yeah, like just, just sort of subverting the definition here that it's not just the problem you're solving, you're getting to some that's I think what it is. It's um, yeah. it's the design isn't is problem solving, but it's not just the problem you're solving. It's a, another really good way to say that. I think you I think you did it. Now you um you're from India. You're in India now, is that correct? So thank you yeah. for me. I don't know what time it is there, but thank you for meeting with us at what might be an odd time for you. Uh, but I what I I know some things about India, but I'm not an expert. But I know that, um, and I can't really speak to like any sort of patriarchal issues in India the way you can, but I know that y you guys have a caste system. So there is in your society, there is like a formalized um, structure of power imbalance, right? So it's deeply entrenched in India. And, and I don't know if, you know, I'm not comparing or contrasting with the US, but I wanted to ask you, given that fact, um, given the fact that you're designing with environments that have deeply entrenched power imbalances, how do you maintain this resolve and continue advocating for change, even in the face of resistance from potentially your clients? Um, okay, that's a really good question. And I don't necessarily have an answer to that because it's something that I think a lot of people struggle with daily. I don't have the power to absolutely say no or refuse to what, you know, what my employer tells me, for example. But I think we still have smaller pockets of power. And uh, there are smaller decisions where, you know, we can put our foot down or we can decide that we will, uh, you know, find a way to do something in the more right way. So that could be, you know, and I think as designers, we also have some tools available like, um, uh, you know, just um, participatory design, co-creation, uh, sharing, and, you know, even um, deciding whether every design solution needs to be an additive solution. Can, can we remove something from the system or can we 
uh, build something which facilitates something like sharing or you know like we're looking at uh, sharing economy now and um, you know rental services things which are and this is a very um, you know small example of what can be done that you don't necessarily have to uh, think in one way for solving a particular problem there can be other ways of course uh, you know at the end of it we want to make something that can help the business but uh, but yeah like working with the people who will directly be affected is definitely one way getting them to co-create with you to decide to decide what their future looks like it's it may not be a perfect solution but it's definitely better than designing without them well let me ask you a follow up to that then um in your work as a designer what sort of positive responses uh or transformations within these big structures like organizations corporations um have you seen that like these places that have maybe welcomed and embraced the challenge to traditional perspectives have you have you like witnessed examples of this where they have like an epiphany and they're like, wow, you're, this is amazing. We're going to change everything, you know, or just change this product because of you. Is that, is that a, a thing you've experienced? Uh, I don't think it's been on a huge scale. <laughs> right. But, right. Um, but I think, you know, I think there are always these smaller moments and mm. I work as a researcher. So my work is to take the voice of our customers, of our users, our or the people that we have been ignoring and trying to bring it in front of the people who make product level decisions or you know decisions about the future of what we can offer or what we will offer and yes in the past uh, we've had some success in you know coming up with and in a way it's not entirely against business as well right because the moment you identify a need that someone has that you've been ignoring and maybe your competitors have been ignoring um, and you can solve that or you can address that. I think it's a win-win for both situations, for both yeah. parties where the customers or the non-customers, future customers get what they want or what they desire. And the business also gets new customers and you know new ways of selling their products. So uh, we, we did that. In some cases, I think in um, I, I have seen it in one of the cases, I'm not um, supposed to reveal what it is, but we we found something that was um, very, um, you know, very fundamental and something that was very overlooked, something that we kind of take for granted. And we 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 turned that question around and we started making something for these customers who were previously relying on other people to do say payments or uh, transactions or do things for them digitally and uh, we found a way how can we empower and include them keeping in mind the kind of maybe apprehensions that they have or maybe the kind of um, you know uh, a certain amount of power that they will not have so i think that uh, there are ways in which we can change things oh. Yeah. Um, no, but yeah, it's, it's no, there. I know it's, that's, I know that's a really difficult question because wins in like a win is such a difficult, sometimes it's a difficult thing to sort of see. Um, you said something else though, that was kind of interesting to me and it's this idea of having skin in the game. And um, I think it's a really good way to, to look at this. And you were, you know, you were talking about examples of, you yourself were questioning whether you have skin in the game because of your background, especially just within your home country, your background is very unique and and rare and privileged, right? Which I, I can say same over here, right? Like I am, you know, I'm a white cisgender male. Uh, I can't, you know, I've been well educated, at least I think, and um, you know, I have like everything. All the doors open for me in the United States. Um, I don't have to worry about that. Unlike many of the students at Lehman, where that's not the case, most of them are women. Like the, I would say, like 
six out of 10 are women is I think the number, um, 98% of them are people of color. Like the doors are traditionally closed for those, those people fitting those descriptions in the United States. Uh, but you are a woman, right? So, um, you, you know, I feel like you do have some skin in the game when it comes to designing certain things. And, um, and I think the point you're making is that, um, though that is the case, like when it comes to socioeconomic issues, like especially money, when money's involved, that isn't the case. Um, uh, I mean, and I know in the U S I don't know what it's like in India, but in, in the U S I think money trumps everything. It doesn't matter what color your skin is, what your gender is. If you got money, you're good. Like you'll be able to gloss over. Nobody cares about anything else anymore. Like race, racism like magically disappears, right? So in, in rare cases, that's not true. But um, I, I think, um, and I also think you, you've really underscored how important it is to do research, right? And just to listen and get a full picture of everyone's gonna be affected by your design. So I feel like you've set up like a pretty good um, one, two punch, right? You have to understand your privilege and you have to understand how you're, you're, you could be sort of blind to people who are not privileged in the same way you are. Um, so I guess my question is, um, we, we always talk about considering the user, that's, a, that's what UX design is, right? But how important, when you're designing something for someone else, how important is it to consider the designer's background, their experiences, um, and their identity in relation to the intended audience or the recipient of the design? I think um, I think it's very, very important. You know, I think in design, we always speak about empathy and putting yourself mm -hmm. in other people's shoes. And I don't think you can put yourself in another person's shoes until you take off your own shoes. So, and what I mean by taking off your own shoes is recognizing what your frame is and recognizing yeah. what is your viewpoint. So, you know, I think um, growing up or whenever you live in a, you exist in a particular society and uh, that around you is a bubble of people who look, think, speak, and are like you in a lot of ways so that might yeah. be geographically that might be in terms of education i mean if you have a certain group of friends you have to have something in common right and uh, and it's very easy to believe that everybody thinks like you and everybody lives like you and your experience of the world is however true and real it is it's not the only true and real experience of the world so i think Unless you understand that and unless you identify what are, you know, if you're like, think about it in terms of like, you know, when you wear, I, I used to do that as a kid. Like if you have a, a, a small piece of transparent plastic and you like hold it up against your eye, it's yellow color. So everything looks yellow. So, um, and you know, same with green, pink, whatever. So I think, yeah, I think it's important for us to recognize that, okay, you know, everything looks yellow to me because I'm wearing yellow colored glasses and, and and maybe it's not always possible to take them off all the time. But just, just knowing yourself and just knowing where you come from can help you form better questions in terms of, okay, I see that this is yellow, but from, you know, from experiences or from what I know from other people, this might actually be white. Or, you know, it's just that I see it in this way because of my particular background or my experiences. So uh, understanding your lived experience is, I think, very essential to you being more present or you being able to listen because um, otherwise you're constantly looking through that filter. Yeah, I mean, I think this is probably particularly true. And I think you mentioned this when we had met to discuss the, you know, the talk, this is even more acute, right? And, and apparent when it comes to like dis disability design, like designing for disabilities, universal design, you know, you know and, and the issues therein. Um, and in, in the case of disability, 
design and designing for people with differing abilities. In I don't know I don't know if this is true in India because I know very little about the legal system there. But in the United States, there's um, there's a law called the Americans with Disabilities Act. You may or may not have heard of this, but um, if you're a designer, I'm sure it's you, you know you understand the idea of acceptable design and stuff like that. Um, I mean, I know you do, but in in the U.S., like a design, a designed object could lead to a lawsuit if it's not fully accessible and it doesn't meet certain standards, uh, accessibility standards, right? Websites are like, a, and apps are the number one. You know, those are the biggest culprits here because, you know, and the built environment. But in like a website has to be accessible, otherwise the company that runs it could get sued, right? And they would lose, they would lose that lawsuit because the law is pretty clear. Um, so my question is expanding away from necessarily like accessible design or disability design. My question is, can a, can a design project, a design thing be considered ethical and credible if it's created by designers who don't really have a direct connection to the audience? Um, I guess that's my question. Like, it, 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 I, I'm, you know, like I said, I, I feel, especially after talking to you and listening to you, I feel somewhat ill prepared to design something for people that I'm nothing like. And, and now I'm thinking like, is it even ethical to do so? I guess that's what I would, I would say. That's a good question. And it is a question that I also have. Okay. Because, um, you know, I think that that's something that I've thought about a lot that, you know, if, if I go and design something for someone and I don't suffer the consequences of uh, suffer or enjoy, I mean, it could be either, but um, if it's enjoyment, that's great. But if, if something goes wrong and I don't have to live with the consequences, it's, um, you know, should, should I do that? Is, you know, isn't that me just uh, waving my privilege wand and then getting away scot-free? So that's, um, uh, that it's a very good question and um but i i i still don't i wouldn't say that you know it's not ethical to design something for someone uh who is completely different from you because i think uh, there are very few designers anyway right like there there are fewer people that that get the chance to make decisions or to make products that millions of other people will use and um, I think what we need to do is just be cognizant of this fact that uh, we can't design for everyone without knowing something about them, without knowing enough about them. And um, yeah, I wouldn't say stop designing. I would say get to know the people that you're designing for. And I think being a designer is an act of power or like being a designer is putting yourself in a place of power where, where you can influence things. And, you know, we have, so in India, we don't really have uh, any strict laws on accessibility. You know, there's a, there's a metro station next to my house and they have a lift to get inside it. But to get to that lift, you have to climb a flight of stairs. And, um, you know, so that's, <laughs> that's what our uh, level of accessibility is at this at the moment that's but, what you're working with yeah <laughs> so um yeah so you know it might not be very strong in terms of like legally binding mm. but you know we still there there's still something there are still some things that are coming up like just last month uh, there was a draft which was uh, published which identifies and makes illegal dark patterns uh, mm. on the web so things like you know really small text and you know hidden terms and conditions uh, not yeah. uh, not being like you know having a default option that's selected that you know maybe you wouldn't have selected if if it wasn't um, if you had to go and select it you probably wouldn't but because it's default and it's hidden you don't really you accidentally agree yeah. to everything so right. um all of those are actually, you know, going to be made illegal. It's, That's amazing. So, so I think there we're seeing some amount of regulation 
in design yeah. work as well because uh, you know because we don't want to promote dark patterns and i think it's great that it, it's great that there are systemic controls to that as well uh, i don't think there will be systemic controls to who can design for whom yeah anytime soon but um, yeah i think i think being aware of who you're designing for it, it really is uh, i think that's uh, that's my that's my only belief on this that yeah just know what you're designing and understand not just the the tangibles but also the intangible things around whatever you're designing so yeah that you that's don't great. have yeah. unintended consequences i think that that's a great answer um I, unfortunately that's all the time we have this was very enlightening <laughs> thank you so much um and uh yeah i I'll, i just want to urge everyone to uh visit with us next week we're going to be continuing this discussion but today was amazing Trishti, thank you so much for meeting with us and uh, I hope you have a good weekend and hope to talk soon. Thank you so much. Thank you, David. Thank you. All right. All right. Goodbye, everybody. Bye-bye.